This one is hot off the press from just this morning. I unsuccessfully ran paid campaigns on Start Playing and decided to run a free one shot to try and drum up some interest. Last week, I had on a 15 year old kid who fell asleep in the middle of the session. Whatever, fine. He rejoined for today's game. That's where it begins. I had four players who signed up. One guy was actually present and ready. Absolute legend. One decided 20 minutes from start time that he actually didn't have time to play. Next one remembered that he had a friend's drag queen birthday party and also just dropped. But come on, man. How'd you forget that? I don't know. Then the kid. Yesterday, I guided him through character creation, spotted a mysterious wand I never authorized on his sheet, and removed it. I told him how rolling for hit points works, how to assign stats, the ground floor of player character creation. It's fine. I built this as beginner-friendly. Today, he shows up. I can't upload his sheet to D&D Beyond. He didn't enter the URL correctly, but whatever. Again, fine. Then he drops the bomb. He's at a relative's house, and he'll be playing from the bathroom for at least the first hour, then inside a car until he gets home from that. Come on. What? Look, I understand that a lot of people want to play this game, but there are definitely appropriate times and places. And in a bathroom, during what I can only assume to be a family gathering, and then subsequently in a car? Yeah, that's neither the time nor the place. I mean, the echo, I can only imagine. I thought some of you would appreciate a change of pace where there's no toxic players or game masters, but instead the horror is created by a combination of abnormal luck and a poorly designed system, culminating in a campaign crashing to a halt because of a single attack roll. The system is Star Wars D20, which Wizards of the Coast created in the middle of the Star Wars prequels using rules very similar to 3rd edition. What's he made a Star Wars game? Oh damn, the more you know. Anyway, yeah, the most important rules difference worth noting for this story is that Star Wars D20 characters do not have hit points. Instead, they have a combination of vitality points and wound points. Vitality was gained each level, the amount depending on your class. Wounds were based on your constitution and never increased unless you took the toughness feat. This difference will be important later in the story. Damage normally went to a character's vitality. If you ran out of vitality, you were exhausted and started taking wound damage. At minus 10 wounds, you were dead. I was the game master and I was running a game set around the time A New Hope would have happened, but in this game's timeline, Anakin did not stop Mace Windu from killing Palpatine near the end of Revenge of the Sith. After slaying the Sith Lord, Mace Windu decided the Jedi Council needed to temporarily take control of the Senate to ensure a peaceful transition. This was actually his stated plan in the movie. As one can imagine, a lot of people were not thrilled with this plan, including a large percentage of the Jedi Order. So the galaxy once again erupted into civil war, but this time the Jedi Order itself was split in two, with one half fighting to control the galaxy for its own good, and the other half fighting for freedom. Of course, each side of this conflict had a considerable number of non-Jedi in the fight. The players in this game were on the side of the people fighting for freedom, which made Windu the big bad of the campaign. About halfway through the campaign, when the characters were only about level 10, there was this big battle I had planned out that would simultaneously have some characters engage in starship combat in the atmosphere, while others were engaged in combat on the ground, very similar to the Battle of Endor in Return of the Jedi. Starship combat was designed as a very different animal from normal combat, and the two weren't really designed to directly interact, which was fine because the two parts weren't supposed to interact directly. I was jumping back and forth between players in starship combat and those on the ground. The players were stomping the enemy, as I had anticipated, but that's when Mace, a level 23 Jedi Master, showed up with his reinforcements. It was supposed to be an oh crap moment, designed to basically put a time limit on the ground force's objective, as level 10 player characters should be no match for a level 23 anything. Mace was supposed to fight in his starfighter for a few rounds, then dramatically leap from his cockpit and use the force to land safely on the ground, and then ominously advance on the ground troops, with the player characters on the ground barely completing their objectives in time to escape to their ship in order to get the hell out of dodge, so to speak. Mace? Well, he didn't last very long in the air. Jedi Starfighters, at least as stated in Star Wars D20, kind of uh, suck, even in the hands of a master. Well, on the other hand, the party's tech specialist had used the, very broken in retrospect, Starship of the Galaxy's book to add some very impressive upgrades to this small capital ship that the team used their mobile base, including a Starship fighter bay, top-of-the-line targeting computers, a droid... 
Seriously, you Aloys get horny for robots? A reactor powerful enough to power a space station, and oh yeah, a single turreted heavy turbo laser. In the first round of combat, tech redirected power from the engines to the weapons, so the heavy turbo laser did 11d10 times 10 damage on a hit, an average of 605 damage per hit. Keep in mind that all starships have damage reduction and that some capital ships have up to DR100 and can take thousands of points of damage to finally take down. Tech missed Mace Windu Starfire the first time he fired at him, but not the second time. A single shot destroyed the fighter, but Mace was able to safely eject due to force power BS. I don't remember which power he used all these years later, but it was rules legal. The master is still slow falling through the air when Tech's turn comes up again. I'm gonna shoot Mace Windu, said the player running the Tech. Um, Mace isn't in a starfighter. What are you gonna shoot him with? I'm gonna shoot him with the heavy turbo laser. I'm not sure that's possible. Why not? <sighs> okay, hold on. Let me go through the real book. Everybody take a break, eat some snacks. Someone grab me a slice of pepperoni, would ya? So I looked through the rule book, and to my surprise, Witch of the Coast has included a small paragraph about shooting non-starship targets with a starship weapon. Okay, here it is. It says you can try, but that your targeting computer will be useless, so you're only using your base attack bonus for the roll. And because he's so tiny in relation to the starship, he has plus 16 size bonus to his defense, so you need to hit a defense of like 80-something. And the only way you can do that is with a natural 20, and he gets reflex save for half damage. Without hesitation, Tech gives his die a kiss and rolls it halfway across the table with a dramatic flourish. Click clack, blah 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 blah, 20. Wow, uh, you sure did just rolling to confirm the crit, that is, said Tech as he reached out, grabbed the dice, and gave it a second, much less dramatic roll. 20. Again, I stared at the d20, speechless as Tech rolled the 11 d10s and multiplied the result by 10. 660 damage. Shame I can't add a plus 6 to that from somewhere. Now, as I said above, characters in Star Wars D20 have both wound points and vitality points. Windu has a lot of vitality, but his wounds didn't advance with his level, so he still has amount of wound points equal to his con score, 18. And critical hits in Star Wars D20 were applied directly to wounds instead of using vitality as a buffer. Dude, Windu wasn't even a splat on the ground. At minus 642 wound points, 312 if I'd bothered with the saving throw, there was nothing left of him at all. I told everyone at the table that I needed a few minutes of alone time and walked outside at 11pm trying to figure out what to do now because most of my campaign plans were scrapped. I tried to press on with a new villain after that, but it kind of just fell flat. The campaign really ended the night Mace Windu got crit in the face by a heavy turbo laser. This is an RPG horror story we almost never see, a story where the RPG itself is at fault, a story where bad game design results in a moment that can kind of ruin the game. It's why I don't design games, because I don't know anything about game design and I guarantee I design a very bad one. I'd also advise you to be careful with moments where you want your players to lose, darkest hour moments that you are trying to put in your campaign on purpose. Now I'm not saying you can't do this, I've done this multiple times, a lot of campaigns actually start with dire straits, darkest hour moments right at the beginning with a cold open. Matt Coville did a whole video about it. I think that works, but when you put players against a wall and you tell them they can't get over it, they might just find a way to get over it. The DM wanted this to be a super tense darkest hour where the players run away from a super horrible, wicked threat, but that's not what happened. They just blew up Mace Windu with a big old gun, which, you know, it was within the rules of the game. Again, I'm not saying this technique can't work. I did this on a streamed game for crying out loud, but I will say that when you do this, you need to be careful. Maybe throw your BBEG at the players when they have a big gun. At the very least, try to avoid that. New here and wanting to get the story out because it gives me nightmares to this day. Now I met the DM by pure chance, though looking back, the initial meeting itself should have been the biggest red flag to nope out of there that ever existed. I had posted that I was looking for someone to play Baldur's Gate 3 with in a Discord server. If one were looking at my profile tags in said Discord, in said post, I had said to ask to directly message me. He failed to do so and just directly messaged me, which in hindsight should have been my first warning. We played for a bit and roleplayed as our characters for some dorky fun. In passing, I had mentioned that this is as close to a D&D game as I was going to get since I had no game shop near me and I was afraid to just randomly browse Roll20 and other sites since I was a fair bit shy when it came to meeting new people. Lo and behold, DM just happened to be starting a 5th edition homebrew and asked me to join, which was a resounding yes from me. 
Now, I thought DM was a good man at first. He presented to me, before we started all this, a consent form for the game. So here I am thinking, oh look, green flag, and I'm eager to make my character and start the game. I make a druid, whose circle was wiped out by people in the DM's homebrew world. He latched to my character a bit, and looking back, it seemed like he rule of cooled me a lot more than the others in this campaign, and tried to main character my character, to which I tried to stray away from that. Of course, me at the time never really realized this, but seeing as how I was awkward in the spotlight, I tried to urge DM to give that same equal spotlight time to, you know, the other players. Now, where does the NSFW come in? Outside the table talk, of course! Now DM, at least in my eyes, came across as a very much lonely person. He talked a lot about his heritage, about his past, about his dreams. Me thinking he just needed a friend, wrong move by the way, decided to listen and give advice. I don't know what sort of signal that gave him, but somehow it led to him full on attempting to flirt with me, which I brushed off at first. That flirting eventually got way more aggressive, and I tried to shut it down by telling him I was not interested. I stopped for a bit, and I thought it was over. Yeah, my mistake. We started a new homebrew game with some people from my other friend group where I played a character that the DM approved of and had quite a bit of interweaving in the story. Again, he became infatuated with my character, which naturally extended to me, and his messages to me post-session became increasingly more incessant about his want of me, even describing down to the last detail of what he wanted me to do in the bedroom and how I was a tease to him. After the second shutdown, I had enough. I blocked him and let the other players know what this guy was up to, including my character sheets, which had tweaks to it I didn't even realize were giving me an edge over everyone else. This caused DM to lose the table entirely, as I was later informed, this was not the first time he was making unwanted advances on someone. Good rule of thumb for all you fellers out there. If they say they did it just once, they're almost never telling the truth. I thought, I thought I was done. Right then, right there. But for nearly a month afterward, he tried to follow me on my social media accounts, which I blocked him on, then wound up deleting and remaking different accounts to hide from him. I tried to get messages through mutual contacts to me and so on. It eventually stopped. I still have nightmares that he's going to find me, and I swear he somehow found my number and tried messaging me one day out of the blue, which I promptly blocked. Nowadays, I run with the table that left him, and I've never had a better bunch of people to play TTRPGs with. Oh boy, this DM went full bone stalker, and we hate to see it. This is actually scarily familiar to me as, look guys, it seems ridiculous. It seems absolutely crazy that a situation can blow this out of proportion from just a D&D game. But trust me, it can absolutely happen. These situations can get triggered right out of the blue, and you can't see them coming sometimes. Which is why it's important to pay attention to red flags. But at the same time, I wouldn't recommend beating yourself up over it. Manipulative people are manipulative, and sometimes they're going to get through your defenses no matter how strong they are. In my experience with these situations, having a support group, friends around me to talk to about this stuff, well, it has been so incredibly helpful. And it looks like this person had that. It seems like they had that previous group that split from the DM, and even having those people to just back you up in the situation is so helpful for keeping yourself grounded. Eh, well, that got a little bit more serious than I was anticipating. So a little under a year ago, I was invited to be a player at a D&D table starting up a new campaign. Now previous to that, I had been a forever DM for like a good four or five years and was currently running another campaign, so I immediately jumped at this opportunity. This table had been mostly made up of newer and inexperienced players, all with maybe five or six sessions under their belt, including the DM, who had never actually been a player before. He was the DM for those five to six sessions. That was with the exception of myself and this other guy, who both had a butt ton of experience. Though I don't know if he ever DM'd. I will refer to this person as, well, that guy. That guy had also played in those five to six sessions, which were two earlier campaigns they tried to do, but fell apart. Through the grapevine, I heard that in the previous two campaigns that fell apart, that guy refused to play as anything other than a homebrew class at this table with a brand new DM who had never played before. Classes that I later found out were from D&D Wiki. Along with this, that guy would also refuse to share what class or race he was ever playing as. That guy's character just so happened to be then significantly stronger than everyone else's characters in just about hmm, every single way. The DM was, still is, good friends with that guy and always seemed to listen to them and follow what they said. 
This caused a lot of friction between that guy and some others at the table. When the group chat for this new campaign was made, the DM stated up front that the new rule for this campaign would be that everyone had to share with the rest of the party what class they were playing. As we started bouncing ideas off of each other in the chat as to what we would play, that guy stated he was going to be playing as a homebrew class called the Quiz... Damn it. Cuisine. Quizina. I quickly took a look at the class, and as anyone who read the link could tell, it is ridiculously overpowered. I really couldn't help but feel as though that guy was trying to pull one over on the new DM who didn't know any better about game balance. I brought up my concerns to the DM in private, going over some of the class's abilities and comparing to similar official class abilities. For example, it has a sort of combination of the Barbarian's 9th level feature called Brutal Critical and the Monk's 5th level feature called Stunning Strikes as just one of its 7 first level features, and how in certain cases, it really stepped on his toes and authority as the DM. The DM took what I said in mind, and together we found a different homebrew class, the chef that had the same concept, but was more appropriately balanced. Onward to the campaign we went. For the first few sessions, there weren't too many problems. That guy did sort of act and talk like he knew better than everyone else, but most of the table, with the exception of one player whom that guy always butted heads with, well, they were willing to tolerate it as long as it didn't get any worse. It got worse. That guy soon sort of developed a main character attitude, constantly leaving the area where the rest of the party is roleplaying with each other to have the DM concentrate on where he was going, often building a nest as his character was a duck for like 20 minutes. This happened at least once, sometimes twice a session. He, depending on whose interpretation you ask, I didn't witness the interaction myself, criticized the player he bud heads with for multi-classing to take a level of fighter on his five levels of barbarian, claiming that they hadn't put the effort into the role-playing of the game to earn it. Worst of all, that guy started consistently arguing against the DM over rulings at the table because the DM was new and that guy knew a lot about D&D. He would just concede or take that guy's argument or complaint for fact. The DM also listened to my advice a lot. I had been helpful at the table guiding the party to bite the plot hooks or offering my knowledge of rules when asked. I have most spells, class features, and the stats and costs for weapons, armor, tools, equipment packs, and rules in general memorized. Because the DM listened to me as well, I started arguing against that guy when I thought he was overstepping. For example, we had a boss fight against this necromancer. That guy left the necromancer's range and they cast Inflict Wounds as an opportunity attack. You can't do that. Inflict Wounds is a cleric spell, unless he has the Warcaster feet. He can't cast a spell as an opportunity attack. DM, who doesn't know what the Warcaster feat is, again new to the game, it's an ability I gave him to cast Inflict Wounds when people leave his range. Well, that's against the rules. If you don't specifically give him the Warcaster feat, then they can't do that. The DM looks at me. Well, NPCs, especially the bosses, don't necessarily have to follow the same rules that player characters are bound to. They're the bosses, after all. At the end of the day, you're the DM. If you say the Necromancer can do that, he can. Or if you say now he has the Warcaster feat, then he now has the Warcaster feat. It's your call. DM stands by the boss ability. That guy doesn't like that. This sort of stuff went on and on, but the DM wasn't really willing to do anything about it. That guy would also constantly talk about a one-shot that he wanted to run for us. After months, it was never ready. One week at the end of the session, the DM said he needed a small break for next week and asked if anyone else wanted to DM a one-shot. That guy remained silent, so I offered up myself as I have a few one-shots in my back pocket if need be. We discussed the one-shot in a new group chat and I told everyone to make a level 6 character and give themselves a free feat. That guy asked if there were any rules for character creation. I took this as a way of asking if he could play a homebrew class. I stated that I would allow any class slash subclass that's from a book that I own, which is most of them. Later on, he sent me a picture of the stats he rolled, asking if they were okay. He rolled 6 d20s instead of 4 d6 with the lowest reroll ones dropped, a system that I explicitly stated earlier we would be using. These stats were 18, 17, 16, 16, 14, and 12. He then sent a follow-up text saying, Oh wait, I forgot we're using 4 d6, not 6 d20. What do you want me to do? Something I noticed with this that guy is that his that guy game is built around deniability. I responded, we're going to go with 46, drop the lowest reroll ones. Everyone will roll for stats at the table. 
game time came, and that guy showed up with a lore bard with a spell casting adept feat. Nothing out of the usual. Then the first combat came up, and that guy revealed that he had taken Eldritch Blast and Hex from the feat. Now, that wouldn't really be a problem, but another person, by far the least problematic player in the group, had made a Warlock, and this was already known by everyone. That guy pointed out to this non-problematic player that he could do everything his character could do, and he would still have all his spell slots left. He had this really smug look about him as he said this, and it really sort of stepped on the Warlock's toes. That guy then used the rest of the spell slots to spam Silvery Bar barbs almost every round. The one shot still went great regardless, we all had a lot of fun. The main campaign continued and eventually that guy stated he would no longer be available on the day we played as school was starting up. This is apparently what ended the previous two campaigns as DM wasn't going to run the game without him. DM said he would move the game to Saturday during the day but then never set up another session. Ironically, that guy would almost always text old group chats on the nights we played asking if anyone wants to get online to play video games with him for a few hours. A little under a month after the group's hiatus, I started up a new group chat and campaign for everyone in the old game. The DM was pretty excited to actually experience the game as a player and admitted that being a DM was really draining for him. I did not invite that guy to play with us. Every once in a while though, when he texts the old group chat to see if anyone wants to play video games on Wednesdays, the day that we play, or play D&D on Saturday, the answer from everyone is always no. Well, not gonna lie, I can't help but grin. Sometimes kicking someone via an omission of invitation is just the simplest and easiest way to do it. This that guy has a variety of problems. Is it the worst that we've ever seen? No. Is it the worst in this video? Also, no. But at the same time, this guy does have some issues that can absolutely ruin a game. We've seen main character syndrome constantly, but this is another version of main character syndrome. Exploiting a new DM's lack of knowledge to gain power over the rest of the group. Look, being a new DM is hard as is. I understand completely why a lot of people are hesitant to jump into the pool so to speak just because yeah there's a lot of difficulty and pressure that comes with being brand new to running the game however guys like this just make it way way worse exploiting lack of knowledge to be more powerful than the rest of the group is not only selfish but very very manipulative on top of that it's just antithetical to what DD is we're working together to create this game to create this story as a group and one guy just wanting to be better than everyone else get the spotlight and be the best around well it's not what DD is about and the pursuit of that want is going to ruin the game for everyone i'm sure there's that guy sitting alone wondering where it all went wrong but a little bit of self-analysis and i think the answer to that question is rather obvious game night at the friendly local game store we tried not to judge, but you could tell right away from the get-go that Newbie was going to be a problem. Saunters in, wearing all black and stainless steel skull rings, slouches in his chair like he's the hot stuff, makes small talk with the rest of the players, taking effort to point out that his favorite media properties are way cooler than theirs, comes prepared with a ready-built character, a stock-standard mysterious rogue with a mysterious backstory, bends DM's ear before a game about wanting a real campaign. Veteran players sigh internally. Start off in a tavern, cliche because it works. DM describes a packed tavern on a cold winter's night with snow gently falling. Inside, a jovial scene that includes a roaring fire, a cheerful half-orc bartender, and a human barmaid. For once, the newbie with the edgy rogue is not, he's not sitting in the corner this time. He is instead talking with the barmaid. You're cute, he says. She blushes and thanks him. How much? He asks. She quotes him prices for a drink and a meal. No, says Newbie. I mean, how much to get you to come to my bedroom tonight? DM sighs. Quite externally this time. Dude, she scoffs at you and walks away towards another table. Newbie sneers at the DM. I catch her by the arm and tell her that's no use playing, and I know how to make it good for her if that's what she's worried about. DM says the barmaid shakes out Newbie's grasp and continues walking away. Newbie gets pissed and starts yelling at the DM that he should at least get to roll persuasion, and DM's playing the barmaid all wrong. DM tells him the barmaid's not prostitute, to which Newbie replies, Of course she is! That's what wenches do! 
At this point, another player cuts in to the effect that actually most taverns in the Middle Ages were family-owned businesses, meaning the waitstaff was usually the owner's relatives. Taking the cue, DM says the bartender taps newbie rogue on the shoulder and asks why he's getting all handsy with his kid. Q screaming newbie arguing with the rest of the table that the DM is pulling stuff out of his ass because how could a half-orc father have a human child? The argument goes on for 10 minutes. At one point, the player says, well, in real life, there are mixed race people with lighter skin. More shockingly, there are also mixed race people with darker skin. Or, and hear me out on this, another explanation could be, ooh, adoption. But yeah, that works too. Finally, Newbie has had enough and says, You know what? Screw this. I'm going to stab the bartender dead and take the wench and drag her behind the bar to get some. Oh, great. We all saw this coming, didn't we? We all knew the trajectory of where this was going to go. You know, I, th I think that makes it a little bit easier. Argument stops. Table is stunned. DM starts to ask if he's sure, but is interrupted by newbie rolling to hit and then for damage. DM leans back tiredly. After a moment, he asks the player to his left to borrow his d20s. The player hands DM a d20, and DM asks if he can borrow another. DM goes around the table, borrowing every player's d20. Some have extras for spare or luck or to speed up rolls with advantage. Then he goes up to the store counter and gets more d20s, winding up with about two dozen 20 siders in all. Nobody knows what he's up to. Finally, he sits back behind the screen and speaks. Okay, your attack hits, and the dagger sinks into the bartender's belly. He stumbles backwards, clutching his side. The barmaid screams and gets the attention of all the other patrons. For a second, there is complete silence. Then voices. Oh my god, he just stabbed old Otto. He's gonna kill him! What? If the bartender dies, then that means no beer. No beer. No beer! All eyes turn towards you as the cry goes up. Get him! Rolling initiative for the entire bar. Don't threaten the guy who pours the drinks. DM rolls, and it's a tidal wave of D20s of all sizes and materials clattering across the table like aggressive stone tumbleweeds, ricocheting off each other, knocking over minis, and making an ungodly racket. DM asks the other players what they're doing. They opt to sit at their tables, sipping their drinks as Newbie's rogue is dogpiled by like 20 half-drunken commoners. He tries to fight back, but is quickly grappled to the ground and beaten unconscious by nearly 50 fists, doing uh, 1d4 damage each. Oh, and an old man with a walking stick that dealt 1d6. The mob steals all the rogue's gear, including his clothes, drags his unconscious body outside, and hangs him from a tree by his ankles upside down and naked. Oh, and I should remind you that's on a cold winter night with snow gently falling. They also use hot pitch to write look at his ass on his rear end. Newbie is seething. The rest of the players are just laughing their asses off. Meanwhile, the party gives the bartender medical attention, getting some free drinks for their trouble. Later on, after picking up the quest hook, they take pity on the sulking noob and cut his rogue down, on the logic that it might be useful if there are traps. Newbie goes with him on the adventure, but he's clearly deflated. He leaves the game halfway through, making some excuse about some other things to do. He, well, he never returns to the store. What a terrible tragedy that is. You know, you'd be really surprised how tight-knit communities at local game stores can really be. The culture there can get really, really familiar with each other, and therefore, when somebody comes in and acts like a creep, the people can react pretty negatively, for good reason, too. And here, we see some good old-fashioned humiliation as a tactic. Now, I will say that, as I always recommend, take things out of game. If you see something that you think is going to make people uncomfortable, that makes you uncomfortable, just shut it down. Out of game, shut it down. Just say, you're done, this isn't happening, you can't do this. Though, I will say that a clattering sea of D20s, as this entire bar and the DM teach this rogue the wisdom behind behind Vander's words, yeah, that's fun too. Though again, out of game is your best, quickest, easiest, simplest, etc, etc option. Alright, and that's going to be it for today's episode of RPG Horror Stories. If you guys enjoyed it, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then you can check out our Q and Play series where I answer your questions in a rambly unscripted format while playing some video games. And while you're there in the cards, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories and thoughts, go down to the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment his gamer girlfriend to let me know you made it to the end of the video. And that's our comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell. Thank you.